Welcome to Alfalfa, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're coming at you. We're, we're back together. The band's back together after a week off. Uh, I'm currently in Athens, just checked into my hotel. View of the Acropolis, very inspiring. And it's what, 6 a.m. where you guys are? 7 a.m.? Oh, good morning, boys. Good Hello. morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you had your coffee yet, Stephen? It's in progress. <laughs> It's also the the eve of your birthday, Armand. Isn't that right? It is. It is. Uh, May the 4th. Tomorrow's my birthday. Cinco de Mayo. And uh, going to uh, gonna go tour the Acropolis. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tap in and uh, download some ancient deposits of wisdom is actually the intention I've set for myself. So... Um, I'm actually not kidding. I'm really going to try and like, I remember when we were listening, Stephen, to <laughs> Stephen, you remember when we were listening to uh, Sadhguru and he was talking about these ancient deposits in Tibet and all that stuff. So that's like, that's where my brain's at right now. Stephen and I were listening pre mushrooms when we did that episode um, <laughs> to Sadhguru on Joe Rogan. And he was talking about like places that have very special energy I think this is going to be one of those. So let's see how it goes. Um, agenda for today, everybody. So we obviously have some very big things that have happened. It's been a shit storm, terrible week in crypto. We're going to talk about that. The highlight of that is really going to be what happened around this Yuga Labs other side land sale and the shit show that ensued uh, across many factors. Uh, the, the mint itself is really what we're going to cover and, and what that means next. And then we're going to dive into Roe versus Wade, uh, potentially being overturned by this draft document that has now circulated the world and uh, the world is in chaos. And one of the things that we fundamentally believe is that this probably is the most complex topic in existence. I mean, there is so much nuance and layers of stuff that we can peel back. And unfortunately, most people and most of your friends, and if you're listening, your family are probably... Uh, very black or white about the topic. And so what we'd like to do is really just take the time to explore it in a more um, detailed, nuanced way, probably unlike anything you've honestly heard before. I I hope that we can serve as like an outlet for that and really take a different approach here to it. We don't have an opinion set in one way or another. I think we're going to explore it. We're going to debate it and see where it goes. And that's going to cover our life segment today as well. So investing will be Yuga Labs and then policy and life today will be will be uh, Roe versus Wade. So let's do it. Let's dive into the uh, alfalfa fire round. Uh, who's got something hot that wants to start first? I've, I've got just depression for you. <laughs> do, you want, do, you want more, do you want more market-wide depression? Should we, should we sandwich yeah. his depression in the middle or <laughs> should he start? Where, where should Steven start? I, depre- I sold some of- stuff too. I uh, got rid of uh, anything outside of Bitcoin and ETH. Um, I think the main one I sold was some Luna and, uh, yeah, expecting this week to be kind of like a little, uh, fake out for the fools. You know, I think when the fed announces 50 basis points, it'll kind of confirm what people are expecting, see a little bump this week. You know, we've seen some earnings good, you know, there might be some other good, good news or at least momentum. And then uh, I feel like more pain afterwards. So obviously the altcoins not going to survive that. So just uh, kind of pulling out my little zapper wallet and just crossing them all off uh, depending on the day and uh, phasing them out. So that was my week. Yeah, the entire market uh, priced in a 50 basis point hike and a bump after what could go wrong. Yeah, I'm I'm just going (laughs) wait and see mode uh, until uh, FOMC comes out. This afternoon. That's this afternoon for you guys. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Big day. Middle big day today. Night. Yeah. Really curious what happens. Um, <laughs> I haven't been doing much all week other than uh, looking for looking for all coins to short. I put a short on yesterday of a uh, step in. You guys step heard of step in. Yeah. 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 The. The walking walking is that, Ponzi is stepping the the farm coin associated with that uh, walking Ponzi. Yeah, yeah. There's that project where you get paid to walk, which is kind of funny. But you know, twenty two billion dollar valuation 
uh, 32 days after launches. Where can you, uh, where silly. can you short that FTX.com? Yeah. FTX.com for our, uh, non, I wish I, wish I lived in Europe people. like you. Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, yeah, that, that's what's on my radar. I've also been looking, uh, I, I found the, uh, the, the FTX, altcoin perp charts kind of interesting to look at actually the ones that sort of aggregate the entire mid cap and they even have one called a shit index which i think is great just kind of all like the really crappy low cap stuff and okay. it's interesting when you when you pull up those charts in aggregate they they, they, they look identical they look literally identical to the uh, bitcoin uh, 2018 uh pre-capitulation chart they're this sort of like literal just peak Lower peak, lower peak, all at the same level. I'm like, oh goodness. <laughs> so, good good luck out there, everyone. Yeah, I actually <laughs> appreciate uh, the good luck you've been throwing out. You've been throwing it out in the Discord too, and actually, you've been throwing out some more detailed analysis in in the Discord as well. And uh, yeah, is that you um, balancing out your nihilist uh, Stephen mode? Just giving everyone a nice little positive good luck at the end of every <laughs> bearish comment in the Discord. It's more like the, you know, good luck after you get off the boat at Normandy. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll Aren't see how glad you're here for this. I think you're, podcast. you're hopeful though. That's, that's, that's the underlying. I think you're obviously hopeful. Oh, it. I'm long-term very hopeful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, uh, do you have anything else to, to add uh, there other than the weight? I think weight just that, uh, you know, in talking to Steven, I know that he's like so, so devastated and depressed, but like, he's giving me hope. He's giving me hope that like, hmm. you know, this will pass. And you know, when it does, I think the party's going to be back on. So, well, they didn't make that this too shall pass saying for nothing. Um, it definitely will, but it's going to be, it, it's not looking good. Um, I'll go really quick. I mean, so I received a, a, a deed of other side land, other side land is what we're going to be going through in this uh, segment. But, um, you know, look at the, at the peak in terms of ape coin price, <clears throat> this is worth about $20,000, which is awesome. Uh, I was there for the, for the mint. I'll save that for our discussion to kind of talk about what I did, but um, yeah, I mean, receive this land. Uh, overall, I was just kind of taking a look at like what this purchase of a mutant ape has resulted in for me. Uh, I think it was approximately at the time in dollars, maybe 20,000 USD that has turned into at least uh, 200,000 USD dollars. So I, I, it's the gift that keeps on giving is what I called it in our chat. I've received, you know, $50,000 in ApeCoin and whitelist to multiple projects that I don't even factor into the 200,000. The mutant itself uh, hit 40 ETH floor the other day and mine's not even a floor mutant. So uh, it is really the gift that keeps on giving, but I'm a little bit bitter. I'm a little bit upset with Yuga and um, I'll save it for our discussion, but like that mint and what Yuga has done over this last week with the way they approached this, uh, this mint for the other side deed land sale was fucking terrible. And I hated it. I hated all of it. And I'm can like, you just, basically uh, can where... you tell people exactly like what happened real quick and we yeah. can just get right into it. Yeah. So yeah, let's just set that stage. Um, so Yuga Labs is the company that owns the Board Ape Yacht Club NFT, the Mutant Ape NFTs, the uh, what else do they own? The 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 kennel, uh, the dog kennel club. Um, they also acquired recently CryptoPunks, as we discussed in a recent episode. We actually have two episodes dedicated to to a lot of this, so it'd be good, I think, to to listen to those as context. And the big play that's been coming is that they have this metaverse that they're building. And this is the most hyped NFT launch, honestly, of all time, even bigger than the Invisible Friends one that we discussed on a different episode. And essentially what people are purchasing is a, is a piece of metaverse land. This is just digital fucking metaverse land. 55,000 pieces of it, if I'm not mistaken, in this first land sale. And the mint was a couple days ago. They uh, initially talked about doing a Dutch auction for this land. 
And a Dutch auction is when you work your way backwards from a high price to a low price. So you start with some arbitrary number like 10 ETH and whoever wants to buy a 10 ETH that has that, uh, you know, that has that ETH goes and buys and then they work their way down. And, if, and what that should do is alleviate the traffic essentially to the Ethereum ecosystem and make it so that the gas prices and the overall uh, competition or really the competition for block space at that given time to mint those NFTs is limited. And Yuga Labs came out with a tweet and said, uh, Dutch auctions are bullshit and we have a better way. I was like, okay, wow, this is going to be good. Like they're going to, they're, they're thinking community first. And what ended up happening is what they did is they essentially said that, um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, I, it, it's hard to know if it ended up being worse because we'll never, you know, we, we didn't get to properly like split test this. We'll never know, like, was it worse or better? Um, but ultimately, um, it was worse. It ended up, yeah, I, I think it was. And this is the contract optimization piece aside, but it ended up costing 305 ApeCoin, which at the time was approximately $7,000. Uh, I think close to $7,000 for one piece of land, one piece of metaverse land. And when you went to mint, because of the demand, there's, there's, I actually don't know how many people were whitelisted. I want to say it must have been at least 30,000 people were qualified to, and they had to KYC, know your customer. So they had to literally give their social security number to Yuga Labs so that Yuga Labs could report that to the government. So this entire trade and everything that you did, which was very controversial in and of itself for the for the crypto space. Uh, I think Eric and I did it, and most people I know did not do it because they don't want to KYC. So you had to KYC. That was their first filter. Second filter was the fact that it cost seven thousand dollars, and then you show up to that mint, and the demand was just so insane that it cost. I don't think at any point in in the minting process, it caught Gwei was at around 7,000 Gwei the entire time. So wow. I want to say it was something around 2.3 ETH, like minimum to get the transaction to go through. That's insane. So your NFT costs $7,000 and the gas, which is your transaction fee, partially to the Ethereum network and partially to the miner as an incentive to get them to, to perform this transaction was equivalent to the price of the NFT. So if you weren't an absolute whale or just someone with a brain, you sat back and said, no, thank you. And that pissed off a lot of people in the community, the wider community, the community that was minting. And it was just an absolute shit show. So, so I think you I just alluded to, I think you alluded to it, but I wanted to ask you, did you push your transaction through at that gas price? So I lost one ETH. In uh, in gas, I did so not get my transaction. Transactions, not, yeah, my transaction did not go through, and oh, I'm one of the bummer, people dude. who's yeah. I mean, but Armand, you got one bummer. airdropped. Is that right? Right. So if you owned okay. a board ape or a mutant ape, you got one, and so that makes you feel a little better. But to be honest, I was in the Discord telling people that I was like just. It was a really sad day for the space, in my opinion. There was a lot of very upset, sad, disappointed people. And most of those people were non board ape, mutant ape holders. But I honestly, for the first time, went in and really just started engaging with this community and saying, like, as a mutant ape holder who has just airdropped one of these, I'm really sorry. This was terrible. The fact that, think about what these people went through. They had to go buy. Seven thousand dollars in, in a shit coin that has dropped like <laughs> almost fifty percent in value from the time that they. Which, by the way, in our it. Discord, we we did discuss when when to get out of your uh, ape coin, and we almost timed it perfectly. Perfectly. So they had to go purchase this shit coin, show up, spend ETH, or look at it and go, "I'm not an idiot. Why would I spend seven thousand dollars in in ETH on this when I've been working so hard to accumulate my ETH?" And they just sat there and, and then they couldn't then they couldn't swap their ape coin back to Ethereum because gas was <laughs> eight thousand gwe. Oh geez, he couldn't even swap. Unreal. Couldn't even swap. Oh, I didn't think about that part. So 
there was a lot that went down. And, and even for someone like me who wasn't in the U.S. at the time, I mean, I had to wake up at 3.30 in the morning just to do this. I was awake from 3.30 to 7 just working on it and watching it, the pages like, don't refresh, let it go through. But then everyone's in chaos saying, cancel, push more, push more gas, blah, 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 trying to figure out what was the right amount of gas to get this transaction to just fucking go through. So wow. it was an ugly day for the space. Very ugly. Armand, uh, it looks like there was something like over 200 million worth of ETH lost due to failed transactions. And it looks like they're going to refund it. Does that make you feel any better that you're probably going to get your ETH back that you lost for that failed transaction? I feel like a new precedent has been set where gas fees are getting refunded on these really shitty launches. So I honestly expected it. I, wow. And and even even are they really refunding two hundred million dollars? Well, they made yeah. three hundred and thirty million. But in their own shitcoin, that went down fifty percent. True. After the they, mint was uh, done. Hopefully, they were in our Discord and uh, sold on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, if I'm them, I'm like hedging with perps. So I think it's kind of like a funny, yeah, a funny little uh, potential scam there. Um, Armand, did you think like Yugo would be better than this? Like they have the the resources for sure, and probably the expertise to like know how to do this better. So it w- is there any thought that it's like uh, contrived? Like this is a intentional mistake? I hesitate to make this call um, because I'm sure if I was sitting down with the Yuga Labs people and team, I think they're probably good people, but I think this was 100% a bullshit scheme. It was all completely contrived. I think this was intentional. I think the community came last. I think they got fucked. I think that this was all just a way to uh, make a, a case for their ape chain and uh, that, that the Ethereum network is broken and they wanted to prove that. I think that that was one big piece of it. The other piece of it was the fact that they were lazy. They could have actually performed this in a way where people would have won and access would have been more inclusive as they claimed this was intended to be. This they was not inclusive. Spread out, they could have just spread out the mid window, right? And then- That's it. That the would way have just been a simple solution. Gary, Gary V with V Friends, uh, Kevin Rose with Moonbirds, many more examples we could point to of mints that went much better. All of those mints have come with their own host of problems. You know, Moonbirds had to refund people, like right. Gary V had to refund people. But expanding the window, and if the demand exceeded the number of slots that were available, then doing a raffle for those slots would have alleviated all these problems. Yeah. I like the raffle from Moonbirds. I feel like it, at least, you know, you knew ahead of time if you were, if you had the opportunity to mint and then there was a backup list and it seemed like that was somewhat orderly. Yeah. I mean, look like, um, Yuga labs has, uh, a a different, a a different set, a different number of people involved now after the fundraising that has happened and the vision that they've set for themselves. And I think that there's people involved that want to see a, 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 a more corporate looking secure future. And that changes the Ar- game. Armand, did you, did you like the fact that they did it in ApeCoin, or did you think that was, um, I don't know. Uh, I liked it because like I was way to get people in the community. I, I was airdropped ApeCoin. This whole thing would have been free for me. Like, <laughs> like I was airdropped ApeCoin. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you were already part of the community, like, sure, that's nice. But if you weren't, I don't, I think they kept talking about this idea of like inclusivity to expand this metaverse play to people outside of the existing community. And that, that really yeah. didn't happen. I, uh, I think it would have been a, a lot tougher to do, but they should have allowed people to purchase an ape or ETH. Like if you're part of the community and you want to use the currency of this ecosystem we're building, then then use it. And if you don't have it, don't force anyone to buy it. 
and then be stuck with it. I think it was pretty, uh, pretty easy to predict there was going to be a downfall in the price after this mint. Right. So, um, you know, maybe not as thought out as it, it should have been. Um, I'd be curious just to quickly talk about like, what is this thing supposed to be in the end? And should we buy it now? Like, right. it's, Cause it's basically seems like, at the mint price, by the way. Right. So it seems like, you are able to take your NFTs that are part of this community and maybe some um, CCO or CC0 projects um, and maybe integrate them into this land too. And then is it supposed to be a game that hopefully has some kind of economy and the land taxes the economy in some way? Like, What do you, what do you kind of uh, perceive this project to be? Because I have never really seen it... Uh, explained out more than a few slides what we went over in a few podcasts ago about their pitch deck i, I don't think anyone has any idea um <laughs> that's the best just, answer well and, and this win. fucked i have no idea no <laughs> yeah. idea can we can we talk about this whole i mean eric did call it. land model like, in general like are, are you yeah does anybody else think we're just sort of like uh we're, we're just like fast running civilization like we invented crypto and blockchains and it was sort of like the wild west everybody was like forging around and now we've created this like metaverse thing but it it seems like now we're just sort of like redoing feudalism in a way like we're just we're, we're, we're sort of from the top down trying to basically engineer wealth for like these sort of elite few who get in early and then become kind of like uh, equity owners in the system. It seems a little weird and, and, and backwards to me. Like we made these eight people rich and now they have this land, right? And now we're supposed to do all this activity on this land and like what, who's, who's doing the activity that creates this value to the land and who's paying them rent, right? I don't, yeah, I don't know. It, I think, it feels like it should be done uh, more like, uh, more like uh, the, the founding of America, right? Every, people came here and then all the land was free and everybody just had to go out and explore and they'd set up shop and communities organically formed. And those people generated their own economic value that made their own land valuable. Like this, this whole map model, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if it's just kind of like backwards, right? And, and, and how sustainable it is. I don't I think know if you guys point. have any thoughts on that. I think it's a, I think it's a really good point because um, we, we put it under this disguise of uh, decentralization and moving value to the, to the edges, to the margins. And uh, it might actually be the opposite. It might just be like the, an old system, um, just people who didn't participate in, in that get to participate now because they're early. I think that's. I think yeah, it seems like point. like the 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 board ape yacht club is turning. It's almost turning into like an oligarchy, right? Mm. Like you've got these like OGs who have mm. all these apes and they're super rich and they own all the land and and then like you guys are supposed to basically just kind of like pump their bags and make them make them richer. Uh, <laughs> I guess like because it was no problem for how them. That pans out. It was no on problem the other for side them to mint. It was easy for them. They didn't even care if they had to spend, you know, three ETH. To, to mint because it was okay, all free exactly, to them anyway. That's right. So like, I think the difference is people get to vote with their, their feet and their dollars in this system. And under feudalism, you, you kind of just like had to do what, mm. what the monarch told you. Mm. Uh, slight, slight pivot. I don't want to go too far from this original question, but is, is Ethereum broken or is it just not ready for prime time? Like this was just a really terrible week across all fronts and and ethereum was like really exposed that it is uh, I think not ready simple, for the mass i think there's a simple answer it's like eth has a scaling solution that involves layer twos and we don't we this is all deployed on layer one and, so it's kind and of why was it that way. like why why did yuga labs not deploy this on layer two could they have was it an option here i think yeah i mean it's a great great question i mean they they should like they're, they're, they're certainly big enough. They can get people to bridge. You're right. Not that big of a deal. You're you saying explain bridge, people your, bridge original NFTs over or bridge their money over or, or purchase land. Do, do the mint, do the mint on layer on, two. 
you even get doing the mint on layer two. And then if you sure, if you want to still have it on layer one, kind of redeem it for a token on layer one. Sure. But like, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, ETH isn't supposed to scale at the base layer like this. The whole point right. is you're supposed to start scaling on the second layer. Like in the future, I think you should have board API club just be its own sort of like app, app specific roll up, right? Like they can kind of sort of have their own chain, but settle it to Ethereum. Uh, obviously gaming can't exist on layer one. It can't even exist really on, on like the existing layer twos, even paying like 50 cents of transactions, like kind of un, unsustainable for those types of use cases. Uh, it, d- it did rub me the wrong way what they did. It, it did feel like they were kind of shitting on Ethereum for stuff that, uh, for, dude, for doing the founders that, it, it, first statement didn't include an ownership apology that was like fully authentic and instead was just like a comment about sorry for breaking Ethereum and turning Etherscan off. And obviously it was terrible. Like, did you guys, did you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. It was like a humble brag. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We broke everything. Um, but you know, I, I think outside of the sloppiness of the execution of the mint itself, you know, it feels good to be long block space, right? I mean, this is like incredible demand of an application on top of on top of Ethereum, and uh, you know, miners made something like ninety million bucks in a, in an hour. So, the producers of blocks made a killing, and in the future, that will be validators. And so everyone will have the ability to participate that and be long block space. So obviously there's still need innovation and a lot of infrastructure to be built and projects need to learn how to efficiently do these mints. But um, there's, there's definitely some, some demand uh, for yeah, the you can, uh, you can think of Ethereum as sort of like a, uh, I don't know, you could almost think of it as like an enterprise software, right? That somebody just paid $150 million dollars for to use for like two hours basically yeah that was a really good tweet that was that was a really good tweet in response i think to Warren uh, Buffett. scott scott, scott lewis, lewis tweeted that right yeah um <laughs> well yeah, yeah. Warren, warren warren buffett doesn't know that someone just paid 150 million to use the uh the eth network to use the network yeah. um, can i ask can i ask <laughs> one final one. question on uh on this topic it's uh from the discord uh listener ashish said uh, do you guys think that this signifies that the NFT game is now over? Like, is, is the jig up in NFTs now after having seen this? Like, over for good or over like, for uh, the next like months? Maybe, like, was this the top? How about that? I mean, uh, I think a lot of people thought that this would be the top just purely because of the amount of ETH that was going to suck out of the ecosystem, right? We're already in a state where we're sort of, sort of trading money back and forth to a degree. Um, mm. I don't know, maybe there's been a little more influx into NFTs than there has been into other stuff in the space. Um, but this is like a lot of, a lot of supply destruction or excuse me, demand destruction there. Um, <laughs> sucking all that ETH out of the ecosystem. And yeah, it's, it, it's, it's hard to see how we go up from here in the short run. Everybody in the NFT ecosystem also has like the, uh, the attention span of a, of a gnat. You know, so like already the other side of deeds, are, you're already down really bad if you would admit a rare land. I think I saw deeds at like 3.7 mm-hmm. floor, you know, plus the two and a half if you paid. To, two and a half mint. ETH, yeah, um, you're down. So you're basically, you, you're basically down when you check. So is it a buy? Let's 10, go back to that. Dollars. Let's go back to that question because um, that was another question on our Discord. Is other side deed land, what the fuck we call it, a buy right now? on may the 4th i don't i don't think now is really the time to be spending cash on anything um especially metaverse land i'm sure there's a good chance that that will age poorly but that's kind of (laughs) i mean kind of my broader macro thesis and i'm I'm, I'm trying to stick to it you got to imagine it's going to be years before they release any type of uh game or something like that that corresponds with this land. So if you do buy now, I think you you have to realize that you're you're in it for the tech for a while. 
I do yeah, think they've been it's... working though with uh, Anna Mocha, right? Who and yeah. the, the, some, somebody else who's already sort of developed this technology. So it, it, I, I do conceive it is possible that stuff is released faster than people have been used to with some of these sort of uh, early uh, promise and then under deliver type things we've seen in the space. Um, but like at some point there have to be net inflows into the economy, right? Especially because nothing about these things is really generating any sort of meaningful, like internal utility yet. Right. So if the project isn't generating its own sort of internal economic value, it can only go up if more people come in to, to buy stuff and than, than currently exist. It's just kind yeah. of, kind of basic like that. And, and they're, they're, they're expanding their own supply as well. Right. we got land now we got apes and mutants and kennel club. And there's, there's a lot of things for people to buy There's ape, ape coin. Right. So it's, it's a, it's a weird and fine, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act, right? You can't, you can't just have 10,000 ultra rich profile picks that nobody can buy and then expect your community to grow. But if you create too much stuff, right. Too quickly to try to, you know, put a little guy in and get pricing down, then you just d- dilute, you know, the, the, the rest of your, your market, um, which might not be bad in the long run, honestly, for the, the whole, if the, 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 the wealthy overlords of the ecosystem take a, take a hit in the short run, but it kind of bootstraps more people into your community. I think that might not be such a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I personally am not buying here, but it, it would, it would be interesting to me, uh, as, as a, as a, as a grab and some sort of capitulation event, it's definitely on my radar. Um, but like, I, I, I am still kind of sh- unsure how I feel about the whole thing just from a, a like a non-trade perspective, right? Just the, the sustainability of these ecosystems and whether or not we're even uh, approaching this right. So I don't, I don't know if I could buy it for like a long-term hold with conviction. Yeah. I mean, I think the answer is no. Like, I think we're all aware that uh, this is still in the Ponzi game mode. You know, all these NFT projects are, so you need more utility or more users coming in. And I think the utility of doing free airdrops is kind of wearing out. And so you might need some metaverse utility, which I think is pretty far away, um, at least in the timeline of NFT users' minds. So if you like the project, you're probably going to get it um, you know, cheaper at some point, probably good probability to be able to get it cheaper. And then the more users part, I think with all the macro talk we've talked about, you know, and, and some more uh, pain for Bitcoin and ETH, I don't really see a ton of um, you know, new users entering the market to keep the, the Ponzi game flowing. So uh yeah pass and wait this one out for a bit i also think our yeah i think people's uh people's default mindset right now should be that they're in a market where everybody is trying to pump their bags and and dump on them right we're not in like a positive sum market um so i think if you have that mentality going into stuff and can evaluate from that perspective that's fine but just just know that that's that's the environment we're in right you're you're likely a you're likely a target for for bag dumping all things being equal yeah and our and our thesis with coinbase um nft marketplace really accelerating like demand and onboarding new people doesn't really seem like it's going to play out the way we thought probably still too early to make that call but i mean they've got like what like 450,000 in ft sales (laughs) so it's yeah. like, like it, it's so bad. Like some, somebody tweeted that like their, their, their dev salary is 10 X their NFT entire NFT revenue for, oh, for the project so far. So yeah, it's certainly, oh, certainly not looking good. And it's certainly, it's certainly a sign to me that like retail, like, like NFT retail, whatever, however you want to define that is, is not around right now. It's just sort of the same people playing games with each other. Um, that that'll be a useful metric to see if if their their revenue ends up ever picking up. So bubble or consolidation is what we're seeing right now. Like if you guys had to choose between the between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're I, I think the NFT market as a whole bubbled a while ago. 
right? Um, yeah. It's very kind of project sector specific, um, but like, yeah, I mean, the apes and the Zuki's and a couple other projects were really the only like clone X, couple, the only things really doing well this year. Um, everything else is really, re- really dying pretty hard. I, I, I think like the, 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 the ecosystem as a whole is, is definitely uh, deflating and we're probably just going to like fast run the, the dot com era, like, three or four times <laughs> probably oh, while we try to sort the space I, out. I remember you know, that. Era. It's going to be, it's going to be quite the, quite the time period for people who are like really good at trading and kind of figuring out how to work this market. Um, but it's, it's going to be like a brutal time, I think for, for, for kind of your generic passive buy and hold uh, investors. Uh, I don't, I don't even know how I wouldn't navigate this space as, uh, as like a casual Hmm. Dude, while you were uh, running around Santorini over the weekend, we were at Dave Hoffman's going away party and I was talking with Ben Lakoff. He runs uh, an NFT oh, platform. I like that guy. Particles. Yeah, he's a good Great guy. guy. Uh, but yeah. uh, the the other side mint was happening while we were there. So he was like on his phone, you know, oh, giving yeah? the updates. And, uh, and in real time, I was asking him questions on how he felt about the NFT space and everything. And, he, you know, he was, he was reluctant to um, give like, a real forecast, but he, he did say like, this feels like very toppy type of behavior. And, um, you know, he, he, he was saying that he thinks that the other side mint was going to dictate, um, the NFT space at large. I, so this is such an interesting point. I think we can sort of work toward closing this, this segment with that point, which is that I actually believe that if this mint had gone well, it could have actually, uh, yeah, yeah, I see your head nodding, Eric. It's like this really could have elongated the bubble <laughs> for a while, and I think that the the, the you know I, I think we we overly discount and dismiss like the positive energy that can go into an ecosystem. Like if if people had come in and won and made money and it was inclusive and it was fair and all the Yes, like a ton of ETH got swallowed up, but let's just say all those people that did enter that new little mini ecosystem won. I think that we could see like, okay, what's going to be the me too of this now? And we would just kind of like propel a new little meta game of metaverse land sales. And then everyone would go, great, let, let me do mine now because that went so well. But with what happened here, I have like a bad taste in my mouth from it. And it's not from this rum because this rum is good. And you guys are on coffee. So uh, you're sober, which is a good thing. Do you guys have anything to add to this? Because we're going to have a very sober conversation about abortion. And Ooh. I have no fucking idea how this is going to nice go. Because we're, nice we're four guys talking about abortion. And at least we're not four old white men. Because apparently you're not allowed to be an old white man and talk about abortion, which I do understand. I think that's. that's we can totally talk about it since uh, the iPhone emoji came out. The, the man pregnant. Oh yeah. <laughs> now we can talk. I use that all the time. <laughs> so, um, Nick, I think if you could just kind of like help set the stage a little bit, um, that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Thanks. <laughs> I, uh, didn't get to read much about it yesterday, but, um, you know, Roe v. Wade was a, a case in the uh, 1970s, um, you know, gave, gave States a little more control to decide at what point, uh, is abortion, you know, kind of, um, need to be allowed. And at what point they could start implementing restrictions. And it looks like, um, yesterday, or maybe even the the night before there was a Supreme court, uh, opinion draft that got leaked to Politico. And it looks like the current Supreme court is on the way to kind of overturn Roe versus Wade. And I forget the other one was it uh, Planned Parenthood through versus Casey. And so obviously uh, this, you know, this would be at least for, for our lifetimes, probably one of, if not the largest kind of Supreme court decision up to this point. Um, and it has uh, obviously impacts on people's lives and political, uh, you know, impacts. So I guess the, the question for us is like, what, what part of this do we want to tackle? What questions? Um, we're certainly not experts on any of it, but it'd be nice to kind of explore it together and see, how close we can get to what we think is true. 
I think it's a dissection. I think it's an exploration, but I do think it's very important to say, uh, at least I would like to say it, that like the most difficult part about this is, is that it's a very, very emotional topic. And we're not women. So like just a very important, I think, disclaimer uh, to start with, because it, it really can affect people. I mean, people have had to have an abortion. People have considered having an abortion that didn't have an abortion that might be listening to this. Uh, or it might be that you're the husband or boyfriend of someone that you told to have an abortion. There, there's a lot here and it's very emotional. And that's why it's so hard to unpack that's why it's so hard to have a good conversation about this. And to Stephen's point, he's never seen, you know, this is one of the things that came up in our thread. He's never seen a group of people have a fair and nuanced, intelligent, intellectual conversation about this topic. And so I, I for one, like selfishly just wanted to discuss this because I want to learn from you guys. I want to hear these unique perspectives on what and how we should be, what we should be parsing out and how we should be parsing it out. Because to really tie all these different factors and pieces of abortion together, for me, feels overwhelming and impossible. But we should try because there's just too many little subtopics within it. And without each of those, you're missing the whole. And if you're missing an important subtopic, then you don't have the right to have a black, white decision on the topic itself. So it could take years to like really go through the, the different layers of this, but that, that's my goal, at least. I don't know. Can I, you guys. Can I tee up Stephen? Because I think, uh, you know, Stephen has a, a very unique perspective on this um, relative to our peer group, but I think like uh, the crux of the argument comes down to where you believe uh, humanity or like personhood begins, where, where in like the, the development process of a, of a newborn, where does that begin? And, and I think like where you define yourself on that spectrum, like where you think humanity begins will really like dictate how you feel about abortions. Um, but Stephen, you kind of have like the, the best, uh, summary about this or like your your perspective is very interesting why don't, why don't you go yeah I, I mean i'm sort of less interested in debating the uh morality or merits of of abortion itself you know than uh, kind of talking about it from a more uh meta social commentary perspective i guess like i i've definitely observed that uh the the the, the arguments I've, I've had with people or discussions, if you want to call them that, are some of the most like emotionally charged and like least rational I've ever had on any other topic. I think actually most people's arguments are, 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 are pretty bad. Um, I think that there's a lot of like BS kind of layered on and, and like when, when you ultimately like kind of get down the rabbit hole of what, what you mean, you, you always sort of end up at the same point. Like what is a, what is a human life that is, has like rights that is worth protecting and, and what, what is not, you know, and this is sort of like a deep uh, philosophical discussion. I, I think one of the main issues with the, the topic, uh, I think Eric Weinstein actually talked about this, right? There, there's this idea that, that humans have that everything is like sort of like a yes or no or, or this sort of like black or white thing. I think he talked about how he was uh, asked to come on and do a, like a like an immigration discussion on, on Fox News or some news channel. And then they were just like, OK, are you going to argue the for immigration or against immigration position? He's like, what the hell are you talking about? That's that's so stupid. Um and this is the same, right? Like there's not like some black or white switch you flip on where something becomes okay or, or not okay. It's it's sort of like more like things are on the, the quantum level, right? Where we can only sort of make probability um, assessments on what, what something is or, or isn't, right? And it's kind of like unclear if it's like a, a, a black or white uh, thing. Um, I, I am like really worried that this is going to be sort of the, the straw that breaks the I am camel's too. back for the, the country. Um, people are 
very, very mad on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is also kind of like a little bit of a left wing echo chamber. So I kind of ex expect that. I think people are a little different than they are in the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think it could get pretty, pretty ugly out there. I, I, I think Nick, to your point, I, I think a lot of like most people I talk to don't even understand what Roe versus Wade is or the impact on it. Right. Um, so I, 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 Steven, I want to jump in. I don't think people really care. And I think that people often don't even get to the most important part that you're talking about because it stops at a line and that line is they never get to the part about the dissection of the question of where humanity or humanhood to your point, Eric begins because the line stops at I'm a woman. This is my body. Don't tell me what the fuck to do. And one of the uh, arguments against this viewpoint is that that can take on a form of extremism. If you have the right to do whatever the fuck you want with your body, but that affects this other literal life and entity, well, some people would say, hey, wait a second, law should protect, law should step in on a federal level and protect this situation. But most people aren't willing to even go there because they're saying, actually, how interesting that you are someone that is so uh, pro, you know, these libertarian individualistic ideas. But then when it comes down to my body, you, old white man, want to have a say about how I need to live my life. And the conversation starts and begins there in many ways where we're not able to have a clear, rational, logical conversation because it needs to be about where does a woman's reproductive rights, rights to health care? Uh, I sent you guys a couple of things as well that are going around from like MDs on, on Twitter and on Facebook and on whatever right now around all of the different number of cases where people really need to have the right to make this decision for themselves. And if they don't, it's like a form of actually disservice to and, and, and potentially against the health of the mother. If she doesn't have that right to make that decision, it can affect her livelihood. It can affect her life even. So I just don't think people care. I don't think they get to that point where they want to dissect where Roe, Roe v. Wade started, where humanhood, child, like a child's life even begins because it it's that fine point of like, women deserve the right to make this decision for themselves and we should not get in the way. So since the conversation is mainly there, I, I, I think we should focus on that. And at least I, I, I think saying people shouldn't care about like, that's, that's silly. That's the whole point of the, 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 why people are mad. Like if Roe is meaningless and it's overturned, there's no reason for the entire country to nuke itself. Cause what are you, what are you even nuking itself over? Right. I, I think one of the, main things you will need to understand is that like, this doesn't like ban abortion in the country, right? It's simply eliminates this sort of like federal mandate about it. Right. And it, it, it kind of kicks it back to the States. Um, so if you're living in California or New York, like literally nothing is going to uh, change for you. Right. Um, to your, to your point, Armand, like I, I think if people who are pro-choice want to bring more people over to their side as opposed to destroy them, which seems to be the prevailing thing, uh, they, they need to make better arguments. They need to learn how to make better arguments. People who are um, pro-choice tend to sort of caricaturize the argument from the right, right? They, they make them all out to be like complete re re religious yahoos who are stupid Bible thumpers, right? Um, it, it, instead, they should try to debunk like the libertarian argument against it, the the argument against it from like a purely governmental point of view, right? Like my, like my body, my choice, for example, is 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 a is a bad argument because the whole point of the root of the argument is that at certain point, like it's not just you, right? And like from a libertarian perspective you have the ability to run around and wave your fist in the air as much as you want until it hits somebody else. 
right? You do not have complete bodily autonomy once other humans get involved, right? In, in other areas of the law, obviously, we see this in throughout the law, right? So if you want to like persuade people from that argument, then you, you, you need, you need to, you need to address those concerns. You can't just be like, because that's, you're, you're making a, you know, you're making like a straw man out of the, the argument. You try to steel man the other side argument, think what they're, they're, they're coming out and then try to, try to, try to move from that perspective. But nobody is really, nobody's really doing that at the moment. Like people are making this out to be, very simple. And I, I understand this because I used to be like super left on this issue. I never thought in a million years I would budge at all from that, you know, but I am, I'm definitely a lot, a lot more mar- moderate uh, on it now after, you know, thinking deeply about it and like actually taking the time to understand where people were coming from, from not like a God told me to do this. Type Let's go a little more right? micro. I'm, I, I agree I'm not you. religious at all. Let's, let's go a little more micro into that. So, okay, why is my body, my choice, a terrible argument? Like, let's just start to, to unpack a, that because that is the primary it's argument. It's a terrible argument because it, it, it posits that, okay, I can do anything I want with my own body, right? Mm-hmm. Which is not true, right? Like there are limitations on when you can do things with your own body, namely when they start affecting people around you, right? Like we have this, like COVID was a good example of this. Like you were mandated to wear masks in certain scenarios because even though it is your body, you are, you know, what you are doing is affecting other people around you, right? uh, Environmental laws is another example of this, right? You don't have the ability, even in like, like most libertarians, for example, don't really have a problem with the regulation because there's this idea of like the, the, the commons, right? Like you, you, you can't like do things that are intruding upon the freedoms of other people. Right. So if you think that at a certain point in time, like a fetus, does become a human life that has rights, right? Like you and I, then in a certain sense, it is like sort of like the most defenseless and worthy of protection of anything in the world. It doesn't even have a voice. It can't do anything, right? So from that perspective, like you can see why some people are like, okay, like you are my, my body. It's it's not just your body. Well, let me the, ask, let me ask a question here, Stephen. Right. Uh, let me ask a question. Uh, like you're putting a pretty high threshold. So like, what if you're somebody who believes that humanity begins at birth when you actually leave the vaginal canal and enter the world? Um, what if you're somebody who believes that and you're now asking that person to prove that humanity didn't exist before, which we can't, we can't prove when humanity begins or end. No one can, but you're asking that guy, which I probably categorize myself as this guy, uh, you're asking me to prove that humanity didn't exist as a fetus, and that I can't prove that. Yeah, good point. You, if you don't even attempt to talk to the argument of the other person, regardless of whether or not you convince them, they're not going to listen to you, right? So to to say my body, my, to just re- repeat my body, my choice, right? Is to completely ignore the main concern of the other person. You're not, you're not going to make them come around to you if they don't even feel like you're, you're listening to them. If they don't feel like you even understand the perspective they're coming from. But this is an area, saying, this is an area people become very libertarian. They're like, leave me alone all of a sudden. Don't, don't, you know, this, this isn't necessarily libertarian, though, is my is my point. Like, it's not. No, libertarianism does not allow you to infringe upon the rights of other people, yes. which is why it's important to talk about and define. Right. What is actually a person? When do those rights start? Right. That no, is I think Ar- Ar- Armand just pointing out physical that discussion. Armand's just pointing out that it, these people are probably like. Uh, authoritarian leaning in a lot of other ways and then uh, all you know, sudden, take on this libertarian ideology even when it's like misconstrued like steven said like yeah i, I yeah. do think it's hilarious exactly. that, like people just like they're, 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 there's a, there's obviously like a very blatant lack of ideological consistency of, uh, on most people i would say right I, it doesn't seem that's like also actually have that's also because as, beliefs, I, they just justify well that's that's because 
as a woman, uh, and this is what's the challenging thing about four guys sitting and talking about this, but let's do our best, right? As a woman, women in general uh, have not had an equal starting line in life for many, 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 many years. And so there is a sensitivity there that you, uh, the patriarchy that is in power is coming here and telling me what to do with my body and how to live my life. And then we can go within that and we can just examine all these layers of situations where women are forced, would be forced to have this, because then we go, would be forced, okay, they could go to another state. I think that was a very important point, but fall into situations where there's a uh, force, there's rape, there's uh, some sort of situation that is unhealthy for the actual host, the mother, and abortion would end up being the right decision, the fair decision. Now, then within that, we have the timing of that decision. When does it happen? When does life begin? When does it become immoral? When is it okay? So there's like within that, boom, there's time. Within that, there's situations that should be valid. Within that, there's I just changed my mind. I hate this guy. He's a scumbag. I don't want to have a kid with this person anymore. Maybe that's enough for a woman to say, I don't want this attachment of this child anymore with this person. And it all keeps coming down to this idea that the men that are in power are making the decisions about how I should live my life. And the men are sitting around saying, some of them are complete douchebags that are saying that they just want the power. Let's just call that what it is. There are many people out there that have absolutely no right to, 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 to have an opinion on this matter. But there are many people out there, both men and women, that are doing the really hard fucking work of trying to figure out what is moral here. Oprah Winfrey was dumped in a dumpster and she became Oprah Winfrey. The fact that people, like I was just saying this to Erica earlier, the fact that these types of situations exist, and then you have the other side of the coin where the people that uh, come from these types of families oftentimes get into trouble. They might become a nuisance to society, some people argue. What is that point? Should we be exploring that? And when you really start, like that's where this whole thing just gets so difficult and hard to like hold in the mind because there's so many arguments both for and against. And then you look at again, where the line should be drawn, what, 16 weeks, 15 weeks, who the fuck knows? Like we're, like we're talking about arbitrary things. Like the, in the moment yeah. that a fetus is conceived, like the, and, and the process begins, does the soul enter the fetus? Something that a lot of people care about. I care about that. I think I have a soul. When did my soul enter my body? Did it all of a sudden show up the moment that I came out of my mom's freaking vagina? Like, that's insane. Like the moment that birth happened, that's when my soul showed up. Did the, did the soul show up the moment that the sperm and the egg became one? Like these things are real and they're insanely complicated. I have no answer. I'm just throwing a bunch of shit and seeing what you guys do with it. I mean, it, it is yeah, interesting. I mean, uh, with, I, go ahead, yeah, Go ahead, Nick. I was going to say, it is interesting with something right. with that many facets that you bring up, Armand, where you mentioned, you know, like fetal viability, context, do, you know, should people have a choice? You know, did it have to travel for that choice to, to go through with an abortion? When, when there's so many different axes to evaluate, you know, the problem, I always, always try to ask, like, is this a more centralized solution or a more decentralized solution? Like, you know, should there be like federal decisions or do we recognize that there are so many different scenarios um, and facets to the, the conversation that this should be more like a decentralized type of framework, um, either state by state with elected officials or on some kind of federal mandate. So I don't know, but that's what I was thinking about while you were kind of mentioning all the different facets of the problem that when it becomes this complex, it's really obviously hard um, to come up with one framework that everyone is, is certainly happy with and let alone actually practical. But uh, Stephen, go ahead with what you're going to say. Yeah. I was just going to say like Armand brings up a lot of stuff, right? And it, to me, that's like the very essence of people clouding what was actually happening here because a lot of what you talked about like 
I don't want to like belittle th this too, too much, but it, it essentially comes down to this is going to be like a big convenience for me. This is going to be very hard for me. It's going to be very difficult for me. And I, I don't doubt that it is like a, a difficult burden to, to have a child in, in, in those circumstances. Right. But we also have to acknowledge that in, in the extreme, right, there, there is no excuse out of like personal convenience or anything or it is okay to kill another human being, right? So to me, all of this is just meant to obfuscate the central discussion, right? When is something a human worthy of protection and when is it not? Because if it is, then none of that other stuff really matters. That that, that trade-off is not something we should be even like discussing. It'd be like, it'd be like akin to like discarding like a one-year-old child because they're a due burden, they're an undue burden on your life or because they're going to become like a, a drag on society or whatever else people say. Right. Right. But nobody's now, going to be able to prove on either side. So I think the more interesting question is like, how do you govern that then? How do you govern when you, when you can't, when there's no, there, well, there's yeah, no that was, logic. that was, that was what I was sort of leading into. Right. Is that like, I, I don't know where that line is personally. I think the only intellectually consistent ones are the life at birth. And as long as it's inside you, it's yours, you do what you want. I think both of those extremes right. honestly are very uncomfortable to me. Right. But very. the problem is when I try to go to the middle, I sort of realize I'm just doing something very arbitrary and there's no real basis behind this as much as people try to invent stuff. So like, I think this is the, the very essence of the extraordinarily difficult problem that is not clear cut and is, is one that is like worthy of like allowing people to self govern at like a very localized level. Like I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm like very counter to people's feelings on this, but like, I don't, I obviously see some potential problems with Roe being overturned, but I think like long-term, this is actually like more healthy for the, the country. Let's just say it was, let's just say it country. was, would there be any exceptions? Like how do you, the whole thing is gray to start with because, okay. The two things I just heard seeing are like, yeah, the, the only thing that makes sense is like at the moment where you're aware, like the woman is aware that, Oh my God, I'm pregnant. And the other moment is, oh my God, I'm giving birth. Everything in between is just gray and nonsense to try to divide some line. So you land in A or B. And then if you do, are there exceptions to the rule of abortion? Like this is like, I, I don't think again, these, I, like, I don't think these like exceptions thing are like that. Like there's like 90% consensus or something ridiculous nationwide for allowing exceptions and life of the mother rape and so, like all these things. Right. So I think arguing from that point is, is kind of silly because there is mass consensus on it already. And they're also like a very small percentage of the, the overall. Right. So to me, this is like another kind okay. of muddying tactic. We should be talking about the vast bulk of them, which are these kind of like difficult decisions. But like, again, like I, I just don't, I just don't think it's like answerable. I think that we have a process for, let, let's back up and talk about the, the courts and everything. Right. Like we, we, we have a process in the country for creating nationwide mandates, right. Sort of via, um, laws that Congress can pass, right? And then we also have a process for creating like act, like really fundamental rights via sort of constitutional amendments, right? So if, if people do think that this is something that is so overwhelmingly supported by the country, then there should be a movement to make an amendment or there should at least be a movement by Congress to, to pass some sort of national law. And I, and I would point out that Democrats have been in control of the entirety of the legislature and the executive branch for like a long time over the last couple of decades. And they have not done this. Right. So instead, we have these sort of like nine unelected robed people who are just sort of decreeing by fiat what the law of the land is. Right. This is obviously not a good system. And one of the reasons why people are so up in arms and want to tear each other's throats out is because they feel like. They have to. It was bad enough when you felt like you had to grapple for the government gun every four years because the presidency mattered too much. And whoever had the presidency got, just got to make all the laws because everything is done on a federal instead of a local level. That was bad enough. 
the Supreme Court is like pouring gasoline on that because you lose one election and then you you get Trump appointing like three conservative justices who are just going to sit on the court for 30. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett might be on there for 50 years, for God's sake. Right. Um, that really drives people crazy. I, I just don't think that's a sustainable form of government. I, I think right. that there does need to be this acknowledgement that like both sides need to have like this like standoff right like we can't have both sides just trying to kill each other to control like the federal government or even worse to control the judiciary because it's going to end with everybody tearing themselves apart we have to allow for more decentralization more state control for people to sort themselves out right like i think it'll be a good thing in the long run if people who want to be in california and live under liberal laws go to california and people who want to live under conservative laws go to go to texas or florida or whatever the case may be i think that's actually like a more sustainable solution for the country without blowing it up and I, and I do realize there is going to be inconvenience for a lot of women out there that may be like really painful right but like we are going to see states like California has already talked about, like funding people to travel there for procedures and stuff like that. So I think none of these solutions are going to be perfect. Um, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think like kind of bigger picture on this and like how you yeah. actually can build society because, because I, I don't really think the original decision was really great in the first place. Like first from a legal perspective, it's sort of like the idea that there's this like right to privacy and the, in the constitution. And then that somehow applies to the situation where there may be an under individual involved who you're harming. Like none of it really was sustainable or made sense. Right. Which is why it's a terrible way to make law. Like if it was an amendment, then it would be done. Like that would just be there and it would be probably never overturned. Then we'd all move on with our lives. But, but because we're doing things via the judiciary instead of like via the, the local legal process or like even like the national legal process, or like we're kind of at each other's throats. Can I ask you guys about state law? Because, um, you know, part of me thinks like um, moving, moving this decision to the states makes more sense because it's, uh, you know, these are elected officials that represent their constituency. So like, you know, that, that should make more sense than, uh, you know, just having nine, nine individuals call the shots for the entire nation. Um, but my question is like, what about in, in like, let's call them like purple states where you have like a very mixed constituency um, and let's say like a, a Democrat gets elected in one term and then like a, a Republican in another. Um, can those state laws change uh, to reflect um, that purpleness in the constituency like every term like uh, or, you know, how does that work? I guess they Are would, you asking, right? Like, you would, can you the would laws want them to. change? Yeah, can the laws in the state change as quickly as uh, you know an elected official comes in who represents the other side, and then you know they're the majority at this time or whatever? Uh, of course, of course they can. But like in a purple state, the majority of politicians are going to run on platforms that are not extreme because they have to talk to both people so much, and it generally results in like more moderate kind of statewide policy. So I would just expect what would a moderate, what would a moderate statewide policy on abortion look like? I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. That's a great question. I think people's people, this is actually an interesting point because I think people's definition of what is like moderate is actually really warped in the country. Like for example, did you, did you, I, I was doing some research on this last night. Did you know that the United States is one of only seven countries in the entire world yes. that allows purely elective abortions after the 20th week. Yeah. Yeah. We're, like there's this we're, perception. I think that we have this like extreme sort of Puritan view on, and the, the, the data doesn't back that up. Like no. 75% of countries in the world require some sort of like additional process beyond like 12, 12 weeks. I think. Yeah. Like I was like looking at are, this because I'm are, in Europe right like now. A real outlier. Yeah. In Europe, like mm -hmm. there's no way that's happening. And most people think of Europe as a, as a very advanced, progressive, you know, <laughs> society as a whole, as a continent. And, and yeah, no, the U.S. is far ahead or behind, I guess, the way, depending on how you look it's at it. It's far off center, right? <laughs> far it's off just center. interesting because yeah. if you polled random people on this, everybody would probably like you'd probably get a lot of people telling you that we are more on the regressive end of thing yeah. but like the data is actually the, the complete opposite like people's perspectives are just a little bit 
warped, I think, like from like a holistic worldview on where we actually do stand. Um, and I think that is also part of the fuel for um, what's what's happening, because from the conservative end, like you see that you're actually really extreme. But then the liberals think like you're you're actually extreme in the other way. And it, it could, could, could make people a little crazy. A lot of the discussion seems to keep coming down to Nick's point of like what you said, Nick, about with really complex, yeah, with really complex, multifaceted issues, do you go more centralized or decentralized? And then Eric kind of hit it in and I'm just kind of seeing it all tie together there. Is the right, and, and, and so like just to play that out, if this does get overturned, if then it's up to these states and places like California and New York, you know, provide uh, abortion health care and people from other states are going to have to travel in order to receive that health care. Uh, how many people are there out there that would end up suffering or not have the mental capacity even or dollars? I mean, I hear one argument is like, great, California is going to pay for it. We'll pay for your travel costs. We'll pay for you to get over here to be able to do the abortion. There's a lot of people that run into situations that just are not in that mind space to be able to to execute something like that there's there's so many problems i can see sprouting just from that alone so like i guess i guess a lot of my question comes down to what types of issues should be mandated through our supreme court through through you know <laughs> the the judicial branch versus uh, things that just generally should be left up to the state and allowing people to vote with their feet. Because I personally, I'm a very big fan of this idea of voting with with your feet. Like you go to the place that best represents you. And then to Eric's point, how quickly if a state that you live in goes from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat, will it then uh, align with your values? How quickly can they then change that a law around abortion, I mean, it kind of ends up becoming a bit of a clusterfuck, doesn't it? You think you move to a place where you're going to be represented and then all of a sudden you run into that situation and then it's not allowed in that state anymore and you've never even left your state in the first place. I can just see this being chaotic in so many, in so many ways, but is a more decentralized path like the answer? Because in a lot of ways for other topics, it is. For this topic, is it? So we're talking like a lot of this like theoretical stuff, but like in practice, what ends up happening is like abortions are still going to happen, right? Like they'll come to yes. California and they'll get abortions. So like um, it, it's kind of like uh, what are other laws that like prohibition, right? When you outlawed drinking alcohol, well, people still drink alcohol. They just it was just harder for them. So um, I guess like to someone like Stephen, do you feel better? Uh, does it feel better that like a life was saved, maybe one or two or three or, or so, like? A few lives were were spared, uh, you know, like fe fetus lives were spared. Does that make you feel better that a few were spared, even though it doesn't like solve the problem because people still get abortions? Like so, so my my personal thoughts on the issue aside, like if you are someone who does believe that you are like actually killing babies, right? Then of, of course you're going to take the perspective that yes, all of this is worth it. And it's worth like an immense amount of uh, suffering um, on the other end uh, of things to make that happen. Um, I, I do think it's important to acknowledge, like, like I, for example, have like a very different view on like what I think is like moral versus what I think should be like legal. And I think that's like true. There's, there's a lot of things in the world that are right. very highly immoral, but aren't illegal. And there are a lot of things that are illegal, but that aren't immoral, right? These two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. We like to kind of cram them both together. So what are, um, what, what's your that's take on that? Because that's pretty interesting. That's such what's, a good point. What's, what's, the, the, what's the legal uh, definition that you like separate from the morality? The legal definition of what? Well, just how would you like it to be handled on a legal basis? Because obviously your morality is one way, but how would how would you like it to be handled on a legal? Yeah. Aside from how you feel, where yeah. should we be as as a society, as a government law? 
in terms of how we protect. Well, I, I, I think that a lot of what we are, should, we should be as a society, this is true of a lot of things, I believe. I, I think there needs to be like a, like a mental and cultural shift in, in the country for a lot of things, right? Like making laws doesn't fix problems. I, I, I respect that a lot of this came from a good place, right? It came from like an era where like for a very long time, women were obviously very oppressed and held down and there was a lot of bad stuff happening, right? I, I worry from like a, a moral perspective that the pendulum is swung a little too bit in the, the other direction. Like I, I've had discussions with people about this and it, it often like, like really – kind of makes my soul hurt how little regard they have for what is, what is clearly like, look, it's, it's, it's human life, right? It's human life that has potential, right? It's human life that has potential that will under normal circumstances come into this world and, and not only do things in its own life, right. But will likely have children itself and sort of set out, set off this like kind of wave, like throughout, the, the future in history that will impact the, the world. Right. Um, it, it, you know, these things will be babies, fetuses, whatever you want to call them. They, they will this be is like, a child. This is your morality. Someday, what about the, you know? what about like, the legal? Like you separated. I, I, but, but like, but, but I'm saying that like, I, I, I want people to at least like have a little more appreciation for, for what is happening. Like, I, I feel like the discussion has become really callous on the left, and, and I observed this anecdotally from personal discussions I've had, and also how like the language around this has changed. You know, it's very popular to call fetuses parasites and, and stuff I like mean, that. I mean, if we're being I, I, I inclusive, that, like, un- uh, like, I like do, where where are the fetuses? I, I do in find the conversation? that <laughs> I do find it very I do find it very uncomfortable, right? Like, I think there is something to like humanity and like the soul, and like there, there's something like we we aren't just like little clumps of cells. And I, I recognize that there's a sliding scale where, you know, maybe it is a clump of cells. Like I, I, like, again, like, I don't, I don't want to like force people to like have babies just because they conceived. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I, I just want people to like have a little more like, for example, like, I, I think people, like a lot of people I know care more about like like I, I see news where like somebody does something horrible, like they like kill like a bunch of like baby puppies or something and like people freak out about it. Right. But like, I think a lot of people don't really care about babies to the same degree. Right. Which I think is like interesting, like how like a lot of people feel that way. And to, to me, like that's, it just feels like something off there. So to get back to your point, Eric, like I, I don't want the government to necessarily like legislate the morality. I, I want people to talk and I want people to kind of come to more of a social consensus or at least come, you know, to each other's sides a little bit on this. And, and I do want most of this to be handled like on a local level where there is more direct kind of representation and control and people have like more of a, a voice because I do respect people's rights to self govern and that. I, I, I think the, interesting question is like, obviously the sort of other side of this is like, Oh, so you, you want people to just like have states rights for slavery too? Like, and and no, like of of course there are some things that are so like essential, like they have to be built into the actual like source code of the society and the government. Um, And a lot of people believe this qualifies things are is, a lot of people believe that this is up they, there they with do. And slavery. If, and if that is the case, like like I said, like we have a mechanism to codify that into the DNA of the country in a way that like really can't be changed. But people aren't really pushing that. They're instead pushing for this like legislation by fiat of the mighty robed people. And we're going to just start getting a battle over packing the Supreme Court and adding justices. And it's going to devolve into something that's really, really bad like we have to learn to kind of like live with each other in the rules that we've agreed to govern society by right otherwise it's going to explode it's going to be very 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 ugly in the years to come like we we have to recognize that maybe everything i think isn't like the hard truth maybe other people do have a point maybe if there is this much resistance to it in society maybe there is something here maybe i do have to make concessions to these people like if we're going to live and exist together because what what is the alternative 
that we all just eventually just burst out into a civil war. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think that's like a good, a good outcome, right? Obviously the outcome I'm suggesting isn't pretty for either side. Like neither side wants like what I'm saying, but that's sort of the nature of like living together in a society, right? If there isn't overwhelming consensus, then we have to have this, 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 this kind of concession, or we have to at least like look to the small points, like maybe the subsets of right. things where there is overwhelming consensus there, and do, and, and do that and, and make something there. Like maybe make a, maybe make a national event um, um, amendment for their enshrining the right to this and like the life of the mother or these things, right? Like something that like there is mass consensus on and, and maybe move from there. Maybe like society will slide over time. That's a good one. You, you know I what like I'm saying? That. I like that one. I think it's like you can't compromise on this very well because you can't do like a partial abortion, right? It's either it's a binary outcome. So I think the, the compromise ends up being like a NIMBY YIMBY type NIMBY type deal. Um, and I think that's probably as good as we're going to get. And I like Stephen's point of like, you know, where there is mass consensus on these like fringe cases, we can we can make that uh, a federal law. That's pretty good. What was really interesting about Stephen's answer to your question was. It was. It is hard, as we started with, to separate the emotion of this question from what it should mean legislatively. He actually couldn't do it. Sorry, Stephen. I'm, I'm not trying to call you out, but I feel the same way as you. It's it's really difficult to like like. There are certain beliefs that we have to respect that people have, and morality is a factor that is at play here. And it's very difficult to just say, well, just leave it up to the state, stay out of it. Like there are certain areas where we do believe that we need to get involved. And to the second point that you made, if we were to just like go toward full blown nuke mode and civil war, like the predominant belief that I used to have that a lot of people in this country used to have is that this place is shitty, that we should blow it all up that they're more a fan of this new ideology that exists than America in the first place. And I mean, you remember this, right, Stephen, like this idea of like, like America was like a bad thing. When you're a really ultra left leaning person, you really don't have any respect for the institutions. That's the basic, but you don't even have respect for the idea of what America represents in the first place. And that's when I caught myself and I realized what a scary ideology I'd stepped into where I was like, holy shit, I'm actually trying to say that my belief in a better world is so strong that the entire fabric of society that exists is not worth it anymore. We should eradicate it. And that's when we start to go toward things like 1984, which maybe we leave for another episode. But, you know, this idea that like we need a whole new society, but maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Maybe we just need good, healthy debate between all sides to come up with a resolution that makes sense for the people of today. That is a protopia where things are evolving and moving in the right direction, but we don't have to kill everything and eradicate it uh, from a foundational level just to move forward. I think that's a very flawed way of thinking that I used to have, for sure. This was a good discussion. I feel like we yeah, we I, we decomposed it and we brought the emotion into it. Like we we didn't ignore the emotional aspect and uh, made some I, headway. I, I was just going to say I really enjoyed you know mostly listening to this conversation. Um, you know, like this could have gotten very emotional, but it seemed mostly intellectually honest. Not like we solved anything, but I feel like you know, Stephen, you kind of guided the the conversation to refuting the the central point or trying to make sure we're whatever the central point is, and that's maybe up for argument as well, but like focusing the conversation around the central point. And as, as you guys were talking, like I find myself thinking about quality of arguments. And so, you know, as we kind of wrap this up, like that's what I'm going to try to be aware of after this, because we're obviously going to see this is going to go live probably Friday morning. There's going to be a lot of talk in the news, a lot of arguments being made, probably a lot of um, friend circles having the discussion. And I think it's, you know, I think the, the the alpha is trying to figure out what type of argument am I listening to? You know, we've talked about before, there's simple like name calling ad hominem where someone's making argument against the other person or their character, or even maybe even like response to the tone that they're making um, in, in the argument. 
you know, there's cases where, um, you know, someone makes an argument to something that's tangential to the central, you know, thing, and maybe they have good evidence and it feels like they, they made a good argument and maybe won the conversation, but really they didn't focus on the, the core point that we're trying to, to argue about. In some cases, people make arguments without providing evidence. So, you know, I think there's like levels of, of yeah. quality of arguments. And I guess, you know, I'm going to try to like, uh, be aware of when I'm listening to all different pundits and, and even, you know, reading things, uh, where their arguments kind of fall and see if they kind of focus on the central point, but I enjoyed this boys. It's a very, very tough, tough one. I am still curious where you guys stand. I, I want to put you in a box and I have my <laughs> box ready to go with a label on it. So can I get your, <laughs> are you for or against overturning Roe v. Wade and, of course, you're allowed to change your position at any time. That's how life works. Maybe in a future episode, you change your position. But I'm, I'm really curious, like, if you were voting right now, what would you, what would I you believe, vote? Uh, I believe humanity be- begins at birth. So I'm pro-choice. I think, uh, I, I mean, I think I said this, but I think, I think from like a purely legal standpoint, I think Roe is kind of a garbage decision. I think that people wanted the outcome. And so they sort of did a bit of like activist judiciarying and sort of crowbarred it, it, in, it into there um, to, to make it fit that narrative. I, I, I do acknowledge that there is potentially like a large can of worms that's been opened with this. I know that Alito's decision said that they're not specific, this doesn't apply to uh, Vergefell, the gay, gay marriage decision and a bunch of other kind of right to privacy stuff. I, I understand there's a bit of a, what, what I think is a moral panic going on on the left right now, but I may, may be proven wrong about that. I, I think this is like an extraordinarily difficult philosophical issue. I don't think there is a definitively right or wrong answer to this. Um, and, and for, for that reason, I think it's like exactly the type of thing that needs to be kicked down to the states unless there is such a nationwide consensus that we are going to pass like an actual national law or amendment to enshrine it. Otherwise, like I said, we're going to be killing each other um, over judges from now until the end of the time. And it's not good. And I, I would like I, I said this earlier, I, 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 I think that like aborting babies is clearly in my mind, like immoral. I think there's like a sliding scale of immorality, depending on like, like I, I, I think I know that the pro-life people think that it's like bad wherever you do it. I think it's obviously clearly more immoral to abort a baby a day before it's born than to abort like a one day old fertilized egg. Right. But like I said, like I, I I'm, I'm not saying that it should be banned. I'm saying that like, I, the, the legal thing is different from my feelings on the morality of it. I do plenty of things in my own life that are immoral that I wish I would not do, but I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a human being and I think human beings will, will do immoral things. Sometimes we have to recognize that um, from like a legal perspective, that's different. Like I said, I, I, I don't think this is an answerable question because I think the question is when does humanity begin? It's a philosophical philosophical question. It's not a question that has any definable answer as far as I can, as far as I can tell, you know, it's just like the, the, the more I like research and learn about this, you know, the, the more I do get pushed like towards like an earlier and earlier cutoff point, because I, I am kind of like uncomfortable with it. And I am uncomfortable just like thinking, you know, an aggregate at like the vast amount of like human life that we've sort of like discarded like just like over time I, I i do wonder how future generations will will look at us like 300 years from now like i do wonder if they'll look at us like we look at like the slaveholders like it's it's possible i'm totally wrong on that it goes the other way um but i i i think that's a, a, a possibility i i also don't think morality is like just a fixed thing through time with everything i think to a certain degree humans are born and constrained by the time they grow up in the circumstances they grow up in. And we need to like have some account for that when kind of like thinking about this stuff, it's not like, like absolutism isn't particularly useful, especially in this instance. So 
I think those are my general thoughts on this. I got a, I got a run boys. So I'll give you the quick answer. Uh, I would say, you know, mostly pro choice. Um, you know, when I kind of, uh, saw this article come up, I was in between meetings and, and walking in the like office building. And the simplest thing I could think to Google was what is the youngest occurrence or the most premature baby that has been born and how many weeks did they, and, and were they Survive. the healthiest thing? I was like, what's just, what's the earliest that we've seen like an actual real life. And it was something like, I don't know, 21 weeks. And that, that, that 21. number that doesn't, that doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter. And that's not necessarily the point. Um, but I guess I just, wow. you know, and that was my initial without thinking it too complex, not trying to make, you know, take everything into account. I just wanted to know what was the, the earliest, uh, uh, someone has been premature and, and lived a healthy life. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, I would much rather prefer to be in the legislative process than the judicial process. And I guess I'm open to varying degrees of federal and state. And I think that'll be an interesting conversation that comes up, obviously. And I'm uh, probably going to, you know, be pretty open minded on to to that extent. But, you know, maybe after this, a little more favoring state level than than federal level. And, And, you know, you guys made some good points for which parts should, you know, take place either on a federal or state level. So anyway, that's a that's the current uh, evaluation. Uh, Armand, where where are you sitting? Well, um, thank you guys for meeting me at the Buck Rack of Dawn uh, <laughs> to do this episode. I abstain. Um, no, I'm kidding. I, I, I was I, like, dude, you do. Oh, you can't do that. I can't. It's 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 so hard. It's it's everything Stephen said. Like, is how I feel, honestly. It's too philosophical of a question. I feel it's unanswerable. If I give you an answer, I don't really mean it. Like that's hey, you how said I you want to put people feel. in a box. I know. Put yourself I know. in a box. I know. Um, Just wants to put other people in the box. Right. Yeah. Check, right. check a box. Right. I, <laughs> One or the other, pal. Let's go. I think that um, there's a line somewhere. Uh, during the pregnancy process where it just becomes immoral and the line should be drawn. And I don't know exactly where that line is. Okay. But I do believe, yeah, but I do believe that um, if I was that soul, I want to live. Like, that's what I believe. I think if you were the, if you were that fetus, I want you guys to live. And that's the complicated aspect of all of this. So anyway, amazing, amazing episode, guys. Good talk, boys. All right. Fun. One love. Catch you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. All right. Happy birthday, by the way, tomorrow. Thanks. Man. Happy early birthday. Appreciate it. <laughs> Later.